Hi there. In this lecture, we see John Stuart Morrison playing against Capablanca. This is in the 1922 London tournament, round four. So d4 for Morrison. We have knight f6, knight f3, e6. e3, a modest move. Very interesting. We see Capablanca playing b6, bishop d3, bishop b7. So content to try and put more pressure on the light squares. We see white castling, bishop e7, b3, Capablanca castles, bishop b2. So this is like Colley Zuckertor set up from white, Fienkettering that bishop. Knight e4 is played, c4, and now f5. Knight c3, and now queen e8. Capablanca is playing this in a kind of attacking fashion. Queen c2, and now knight takes c3. Bishop takes c3. Queen h5. Taking on f3 doesn't really do too much, and it might actually backfire if white can play king h1 and rook g1 later. So we have queen h5, queen e2. Bishop e2 was also possible. So if queen g6, for example, b4, d6, this position should be a small edge for white. So anyway, queen e2, we have knight a6. This is a bit provocative, provoking white to weaken the light squares, especially d5, to play c5 hitting that knight. Very provocative. In a more technical sense, c5 is not as prov provocative, but it should be about even. This position, for example, should be about even. So knight a6 is interesting, and white does actually weaken the d5 square, playing c5 hitting the knight. The knight just goes back. Job done. B4, bishop f6. Rook a c1, knight c6. And then we have e4. This is a bit of a mistake in a theoretical sense, it seems, to play e4. It seems here d5 is a very interesting move, if followed up correctly. So, for example, and this is weird and wonderful, if knight e7, bishop takes, rook takes, d takes, Rook g6, and it looks incredibly scary here with this g file as an example. But with knight e1, now here, black, black's best chance is actually to play rook takes g2 check. Because if queen takes e2, white's absolutely doing great here with advantage. So, for example, knight f3, the rooks are beautifully placed. There's no real problems there. So let's go with rook takes g2 to try and cause compl some complications. Bishop f3 is the key point. But here, if white plays their cards right, they actually end up better. This is weird and wonderful. If the queen moves, we can rule that out. Queen g5 is mating. We have to rule that out. So c takes b6, queen sack time. This position is weird and wonderful. And it turns out that white should be able to navigate this to an advantage. So this this kind of position is in the, actually it's it's in White's favour. For example, like this. Two rooks against Queen scenario is in White's favour. So that's all crazy stuff. <laughs> but uh, it does it does seem as though at move sixteen, technically D five does have some things going for it. But uh, E4 was played. We have knight E7 now e5, which seems to hit the bishop, asking the bishop to move politely. Capablanca plays an interesting move here. That's move 17. So guess what is played? 10 points. So yes, this whole bishop looks really nice, actually, pointing at white's king. We see knight d5. Yeah, not moving the bishop. If bishop takes f3, queen takes this position is actually kind of... A steadier way of playing it and actually white is suffering a bit here this is this is an advantage for black this position with the structural damage this was a simple way of playing it so this is kind of an unusual situation where Cav Blanca indulges in a peace sacrifice a bit tell like now bishop d2 was played just ignoring the f6 bishop if e takes knight f4 white has to play queen e3 if queen d1 can you see what black plays? This is quite violent. For 10 points, what would you play here? Barbarian mode. 
or tail mode knight takes g2 so that if so the f f3 knights undermined if king takes there's queen g4 check bishop takes f3 end of game so but with queen e3 just about white can actually play queen g5 here queen takes knight takes and it, it, it turns out black can actually is black is getting the piece back there's a threat on d3 if the knight wasn't on g5 there's knight h6 knight, knight h3 rather checkmate because of this diagonal so this is actually a position black's getting the piece back so as example if f7 check this could lead to a disaster because of knight h3 is checkmate so let's imagine f takes there's rook f6 with the idea of rook g6 and this is probably why it's best c6 if f3 knight takes d3 just getting the piece back if bishop b1 then there's knight e2 checkmate the bishop's just neglected e2 or even knight h3 check just to show the strength of the position this is also mating so c6 d takes if bishop takes c6 white has d5 and this position is actually better for white so let's go with so in this position yeah bishop takes c6 d5 if if rook g6 d takes this ends up also being better for white yeah these pass pawns are very dangerous in many variations so this position is better for white so let's imagine d takes c6 is the best it is looks like the best rook g6 black ends up getting the piece back here because of this pin so yeah the pin knight gets the piece back and after all of that you know this is like very accurate play from both sides very accurate representation for both sides it ends up being cool so in other words the point is that e takes f6 it's not as if it's a win by force there is a variation which Capablanca himself pointed out in a chess magazine uh, there's a variation basically where queen e3 to g5 should be a, a situation black gets the piece back but it's not as if it's a, a forced checkmate of the white king so fascinating stuff we have just it being ignored though bishop d2 the whole thing <laughs> we have bishop e7 knight e1 offering the exchange of queens Capablanca refuses f4 rook a b8 bishop c4 b takes b takes h6 so preparing some undermining to try and open up this g file and amplify this bishop an amplification strategy you could call it g5 we have rook b1 g takes f4 rook b friend this is actually kind of dangerous sometimes this potential rook left targeting pawns potentially it's dangerous we have bishop c6 and now bishop takes f4 now here this is an interesting moment knight takes f4 is played if king h7 and some sources give this as the move move order of the game it's, it would still be a mistake king h7 here because it allows a very very strong continuation for white so guess what that is with 10 points if king h7 had been played here yeah there's there's two different accounts of this game this, this game is a bit more than some controversy it seems you know bishop takes d5 is possible here so if rook takes there's bishop takes b3 winning a piece so if bishop takes the thing is the rook can join the bishop on h6 and white will be better here this is just better for white there's no attack on the g file so knight takes f4 was played Rook takes, and here it seems as though Capablanca did make a mistake in this version of events, playing King H7 here. King H8 had to be played. And you might wonder see, the king is on the other side of the road to the bishop because nasty things can happen. Road accidents, accidents can happen if our king sits where the opponent's bishop is. And if this really is the case, there is a road accident here occurring. So this version of the game there is a road accident just just before we get into that if king h8 just to show the resources on both sides there's bishop g5 to hold h6 and this position you know black should be able to 
have an advantage here actually so for example here of c6 bishop e7 this position things are coordinating a bit on the g file and black should end up with an advantage in some variations for example like this black's, black's doing well so king h8 black is actually doing well here black does have the bishop pair black does have this road to the king it's a bit of a tell like position there's a kind of principle broken though the principle of the king being on the same side of the road as the bishop and actually why if this is really the case why made a mistake here knight e3 can you see what white plays here which is actually getting uh, an advantage white to play for 100 points tactical points what would you play so i've given you a clue the bishop's on the same side of the road so to speak as the king so what can we do here Yeah, white. If, if white had this position, rook takes f5. Just winning a pawn. You can't take because the bishop takes f7. Queen takes just runs into bishop d3. It runs into that because the bishop's on the same side of the road as the king. Forking queen against king, you know, this is just a winning position. So anyway, knight e3, letting Capablanca off, it seems then, in this version of events. Bishop g5. And then we have rook takes f5. Okay, so bishop takes e3 check, queen takes e3. And now there is the same accident principle. If queen takes, there's bishop d3. And this is winning for white. For example, this position is winning for white. So Capulanka here, it seems queen g6 in this version of events, plays queen g6. So this is a wild right indeed in this game. So what is going on here? And we have rook f2, so this is another interest point. And this is basically the a key move to just make sure black's okay actually. But it is it is a nice tactical idea to say the least. So Kavanagh's tactics are really showing up here with this this move. As being you know often very, very powerful. A little mini combination. So Black to play for 100 points, what would you play here? Fun stuff. <laughs> it's actually bishop takes g2. You might wonder, what what is this about? Well, first of all, if rook takes b3, you know, white is a, a pawn up here. And if check, bishop f1, rook takes, king takes lets the queen cling on to b3 and white's still a pawn up with advantage you know if queen takes then there's queen takes b3 fine that'll be equal so in that variation basically white's better with best play so this is important now rook takes b8 was played if rook takes g2 can you see Kavlanka's fine tactical points being made here for 200 tactical points I must say tactics do do tend to act as caffeine to me they, they do wake me up so this is very interesting check all checks even the outrageous ones limit the opponent's replies and you might find there's, a, there's an amazing resource here it's queen b1 check yeah if rook takes rook takes the, you know, the queen goes in front but then it, you know white gets mated yeah <laughs> If you know anything else is not working, basically, you know if rook takes b3, this is not working. Queen takes b3, holds the b1 square, white's bishop up. Thanks very much. So this position, no problem. So yeah, the point would be queen b1 check. So rook, rook takes b8 is played though, not allowing that amazing tactic. Bishop e4 check. Queen g3, and now we're in an endgame. The queen's come off, so Kaplan has his work cut out here in this endgame check. King g7, rook f4. If king f2 instead, this should give white this position. It should be an even position, really. If white doesn't do too much, this, this should be even, but we have rook f4. 
Bishop f5, and now a key mistake, it seems. Rook f3, immediately a key mistake. It seems here that... Okay, it is a tricky position. There are other more accurate moves. Let's just go with the game here and see why this is a mistake. We see rook b1 check, king f2. So this is quite accurate. But also, you know, rook b4 was troublesome. Skewing the bishop and the pawn. If bishop d3... Okay, white holds on for a moment, but look at this position. The rook's controlling that seven francs. So, you know, the king is more aggressive here. The black king can actually work with this position. An advantage for black will result. Because the king is out and about and helping things. But, uh, yeah, rook b1 check is played. King f2. Rook b2 check, king g3. Rook d2, yeah, this is torture. White pawns are being scrutinized, whilst black pawns aren't. This is a key difference. This rook is out and about, causing concerns. We have rook f4, and now a5. There's a pass pawn candidate here. h4, c6, king f3, a4, king e3, rook c2. And this is really annoying. This is a breaking point. a2 is about to snap off. Oh dear. So, the, yeah, the Rook on the 7th. Nimzovic talks about Rook on the 7th quite a lot because there's often a lot of targets. And here, yeah, this is going to create a, a dangerous, you know, pass pawn now. So it has been critically outplayed, it seems. Losing this A2 pawn, this is not good news. This is certainly not good news. We have Bishop C8, Rook A3 check, King E2. Rook C3. It's making way for this pass pawn now. Doesn't matter about d7, a3. But at this moment, it seems in a technical sense, White's position is on the brink of, of losing, it seems. But White actually makes a losing move, definite losing move here, d5. It seems there's uncertainty, actually. Here, if White had played rook f1, there's an element of uncertainty. Because this bishop is chomping at these pawns to try and create pass pawns itself. And even in this seemingly diabolical scenario, say this scenario, with bishop coming to b1 or to c4, bishop b7, this, this situation is actually rather interesting for white. Because the king is about to play king c3 if the rook ever stops the prison of the king. And the bishop can take on d5. And, you know, white can end up <laughs> with a pass c pawn and winning the a pawn. So, for example, here, if rook takes h5, king c3, and all of a sudden, well, this is going to be good for, for white. If king e8, this position, it seems as though it's even. So, in other words, rook f1 is pretty tenacious if rook f1 had been played. It does seem pretty tenacious. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it looks like a dangerous pawn, right? But um, black really hasn't got too much of a luxury to play bishop b1, you know, because because there's things like bishop takes e6, hitting a2, and then, you know, there's pass pawn potentials. So, you know, black would have to play pretty carefully. Yeah, it's interesting. So, okay, so, but d5 makes things a load worse because it gives Cavablanca now two pass pawns, basically. And the rook has the Tarash rule. Rooks belong behind the Tarash rule. See, but Tarash said in endgames, rooks belong behind pass pawns, either your pass pawns or the opponents. Cavablanca now is a pawn up. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. He's a pawn up. He's got two pass pawns to play with. King f7, rook a4. King e7, the king's coming to do some work here. Also, d4 was strong. Because if rook takes d4, bishop c2 stops the Tarash roll from white getting behind the pass pawn. And here, rook c5. This seems to be a situation where white's at a big disadvantage. 
that's crushing it there yeah what what is what happens here yeah what does white do here to stop a2 if check you know, this position a2 bishop b1 and the rook stranded and black is essentially you know a rook up here the bishop's not moving the rooks the rook stranded so yeah but king e7 is also strong d4 was it seems a little bit stronger but uh we have rook a8 d4 now the overall result is not changing here black is winning bishop e4 rook a7 check a2 king e1 d3 so this means that uh, the bishop is freed up now for things like bishop f3 and d2 bishop c8 is check king moves and white resigns here if king e1 d2 check and guess what we can play here yeah we can move the rook <laughs> this enables bishop f3 without dropping an entire rook so that's important and in this position we're ready to play bishop f3 check to queen our d pawn as an example so yes so king g6 was actually the end of the game so an enjoyable game i hope you enjoyed this and got some instructive points from it there were some fireworks from kevin blank he played a bit like talon this game at certain points so interesting stuff hope you enjoyed it Thanks so much.